be able to answer some of the practical questions I have about this. I hope so. Um, we, I'm with the Paleo Museum. And uh -huh. We, Paleo Stone. Well, yeah. No, oh, yeah. I'll pay you. I'll stay but, uh, a couple of steps. What, one of the things that um, we have found to be true is that most of our users are not in-house. I mean, most of our people cataloging. Uh, so we bring in a lot of data from elsewhere, and currently we have a web-based interface for doing this. It seems like the workbench function would actually allow that to be done quite easily. My question is, you know, how difficult is it to bring someone from ground zero, train them in this, the use of this, and, you know, how, is this something that's really memory intensive for them to be able to use? Is this something that, you know, someone with a you know, a bad laptop could, you yeah. know, could, well, could I mean, do the, the nice thing about the standalone workbench is that it, it'll run off a USB key. It doesn't require any installation whatsoever. So you can plug it into anybody's laptop and you can run it. Um, and now that the facility exists to get something from an Excel spreadsheet through the workbench into your database, you can have people working in Excel spreadsheets as long as you let them know exactly which columns of information you require. Um, or you can just ship them a version of the workbench. They can run it off a USB key and you can provide them with a blank template data set that has all the columns ready to go and all they need to do is fill in all the columns. You say that every column has to be filled out and they just provide you with the data. They then re-export that into an Excel spreadsheet and send it to you. You dump it into your workbench copy within Specify and then upload it into your database. So A, it's not very memory intensive at all. The standalone version is. Um, and B, it's very, very easy to get people up to speed um, in terms of, you know, they literally can work in an Excel spreadsheet and then send you the Excel spreadsheet. You can then take that, map it up to your database and hoik it in, as I like to say. Very South African too. <laughs> yeah, Andrew. Um, do you have any examples from, like, people from, from saying, I, I want to do this and, like, I've got 100,000 records. How long does data conversion Getting out of it's very difficult to say. We're obviously very early in the process of, of going through and deciding how we're going to schedule all these people. We obviously have a whole bunch of existing users who are in five that we have to accommodate, plus a whole bunch of people who have been sitting around on the fringes waiting for six to be released before they want to come in. Um, and so we're anticipating a flood of people wanting to, wanting to get themselves in. Um, initial indications from Glenn, who's our data import guru, um, is that it shouldn't take more than you know a week to do a full, to do a collection. I mean, the number of records doesn't make any difference because all he's doing is he's mapping the fields up to the to the fields in the data model. And once you've done that, it's good for all of the records. Um, there may be a little bit of to and fro with you, between you and him, making sure that all of the fields have gone into the correct places in the database. Um, but it shouldn't take more than a week to essentially take your data in your existing system, map it up to the six data model you know, suck it all in and then generate forms and reports based on whatever it is that you want to create on the back end mm -hmm. and then ship it back to you. You know, um, a week or two, maybe two maximum. But then the process is going to be where do you fall in the queue of people? Um, but then again, it would be a case of, you know, we would let you know that week X has been blocked off for your collection. Mm -hmm. So, you know, two days before week X, you just stop working in your system, make mm -hmm. sure that it's ready to go, ship it off to Glenn. And you can start on day one, get it done by day seven, and send it back to you, and you're up and running in space. That's the process. Of, you know, those are the sort of sort of lines that we're thinking about. But it's very difficult to estimate demand at the moment. Yeah. <coughs> so I um, worked on HerpNet, and so I guess I have more of a HerpNet-centric viewpoint somewhat. Um, so for the people that are, are in Specify and are getting updated and are in HerpNet, would they would still basically have their digger provider or paper provider updated manually. Is that what would happen at this point? Like someone would actually go and download a copy of Specify and then manually make a copy available to their digger provider? Or do you have it set up right now so it can talk to their digger provider? Or uh, in five. In five. Yeah, in five. Okay. In, in five it can talk to the digger provider. It's just that the cache has to be rebuilt every so often manually. The, the there is no cache right now, though. No, within oh. Specify. There's a cache okay. within, within Specify. Essentially what it is is a plug that fits into the back of your database uh, with all the Darwin core fields. And it creates a cache from that uh, okay. of a flat file version which is then shipped out to whoever wants it. Okay. And that cache has to be rebuilt manually within Specify. Okay. There's no automated process built into Specify. But if you have enough knowledge of MSSQL, you can generate a script that'll, that'll run it automatically. 
we have at Kansas, we've, our IT guys have generated a script that runs the cache every week and rebuilds it every week. And so, you know, it's up and running all the time. And same functionality is going to be built into six. Okay. Um, so it'll, hand, it'll handle, okay. from the initial discussions that we've had, it'll handle multiple versions of Darwin Core, it'll handle uh, Tapia, it'll handle ABCD, and it'll handle um, the ability to just dump it as a CSV file, which is one of the other directions that people right. are starting to go. Okay. So, um, so it'll handle, but there are obviously folks who are going to want to wait around in five until six has that capability before they want to be converted. And so we're hoping that that's going to take some of the some of the pressure off us in terms of getting all of these people in. Mm -hmm. That they'll you know they'll schedule themselves for us. Okay. Um, so can they can internally reboot their, manually do their cache, or you guys have been doing that for people? For the they people? can do it. There's a okay. button within Specify Five that says Update Digger Cache. And you okay. just hit that, that and great. it goes through and it updates the cache. Um, you know there are some folks who don't realize that it's not being updated, and so don't hit the button. Um, and that's the major problem with, with PerfNet and FishNet and things like that, is that people aren't hitting the button. Um, but, you know, people like Laura Russell can generate a script for them and send it off to them and they can put that on the back end so that it'll automatically do that process for them. And we're looking at working with Laura to try and, to try and get that sort of thing sorted out. So that there's just a blanket script that you can send off to people as an MS, MS SQL script that they can dump on the back end that'll automatically yeah. you know, yeah, update, that really help. update the cache. Because we're sending people all their yeah. reference updates. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, yeah, that's another thing I need to mention about the workbench is that the, the current functionality in the workbench will not augment existing records. It's only uh, meant to okay. import new records. So things like records that are existing that you've now georeferenced, you're not going to be able to bring those in and have it overwrite the existing records. Again, that is functionality that is looking at coming down the line. Okay. The ability to be able to augment existing records rather than creating new ones. Yeah, that's what um, I was talking about with the 100,000 record things. Because yeah. we're sending back text fields with 100,000 records of yeah. new let longs for people. Yeah. And so that sort of stuff would be best either coming through us or going through your IT guys to get them to, to manually put those things in and overwrite the existing records that are there. Because there's, you know, there's all sorts of fields that will identify what those records are and then overwrite them. It's much easier to do it on the back end. Yeah. So once you got everything mapped out, how long does the sucking in process take? <laughs> it doesn't take terribly long. Um, well, I can actually show you. I mean, like per per record, per million records, say you had a million. Well, records. you can't you can't suck a million records in through the workbench. No, not with the workbench. With with your your oh, your it doesn't take long at all. Um, you know, I've never seen it in operation, but you know, it doesn't take long at all. Once you've got it mapped up, it just literally goes through them and chugs away and like okay. pulls them pulls them all in. An hour. Five hours? Well, it depends on the size of the database. A couple of million records is probably going to take, you know, a good number of hours, 15, 16 hours maybe. Okay. Um, it's a very, again, it's a very memory intensive process and it, it depends very much on the speed of the machine. Uh -huh. But Glenn has one of these, you know, quad processor things that he just sticks it into and all the codes. And, and if you had a million records, uh, how much space would that occupy and specify? In indexes and... As a file. Mm -hmm. As a file on your machine. Yeah, all together. Yeah. Um, I really don't know how many, how how much space a million records would be. Um, I know that my database that they've converted here has forty thousand records in it, and the file size is. Hold on a second. I'll tell you in a second. So for forty thousand records, 